Hello everybody, I'm Lingwafiliax and welcome to Minority Language Report. Today we're going to be talking about the language Lakota. 3, 2, 1, go! Lakota, or Lakotia, is a North American language being one of three major varieties of the Sioux language along with Eastern and Western Dakota and part of the Dakotan branch of the Siouan language family. It is traditionally spoken by the Lakota people who belong to one of the seven council fires or Ochethi Shagowin located in basically the central parts of the Great Sioux Nation, most generally spanning the western sides of the states of North and South Dakota in the USA. Ethnolog currently classifies the language as endangered and there are around 2,000 fluent speakers according to a 1997 census which yes I am aware was over 20 years ago but that's literally all I've got to go on if anyone knows where I can find any current statistics don't hesitate to leave your comments down below. Phonetics. Lakota has five oral vowels, three nasal vowels and no diphthongs except in the common greeting how which yes is where that stereotypical American Indian greeting comes from just get over it moving on. Every other time vowels occur next to each other they are pronounced as individual syllables. And now you'll have to bear with me for a moment because there are so many consonants in Lakota that I had to split the phonemic chart into two sections. So bearing that in mind, there are four main places of articulation, plus two glottal consonants, a stop and a fricative, which I'll just get out of the way right now. There are two nasal consonants, the bilabial and the alveolar, and four stop consonants for all main places of articulation with five distinct variants. All four have voiceless, ejective, and regular aspirated variants. All apart from the palatal have variants with velar aspiration, and the bilabial and velar consonants each have a voiced variant. Onto the second chart, there are three fricative consonants for all places of articulation apart from the bilabial, and there are distinct voiceless, ejective, and voiced variants for each of them as well. And finally, there's the alveolar lateral approximant and the two semivowels. And also, since I'm fairly certain people are going to correct me on this later, I do know that technically these are affricates and these are uvular consonants, but first of all, I needed to simplify this chart somehow so that I would be able to draw it, and second of all, native speakers would still be able to understand you anyway. Moving on, stress typically falls on the second syllable of a word, like 90% of the time, but there are a couple of exceptions here and there, with some words even carrying two stressed syllables. Stress is also somewhat tonal in nature, with stressed syllables having a slightly higher tone than unstressed syllables. And while it would be possible for me to go into the fauna tactics of Lakota in as much detail as Michael Miller I report, I've decided I'm no longer going to be doing that, because it ended up being kind of boring and it's not really a necessary thing you need to know anyway, so from now on I'll just be giving you the basic info. Lakota has a largely CV or CVC syllable structure, which is kind of the default for most languages, honestly, and syllable onsets may contain consonant clusters. However, a small non-phonemic schwa may be inserted between the consonants in a consonant cluster, like in the name of the tribe Manikowaju, for example. Writing system. The standard Lakota orthography uses an extended Latin alphabet with the letter ng signifying nasal vowels, acute accents marking stressed syllables, and Karens marking palatals and velar fricatives. Although I have to mention it seems a little redundant to put the Karen over C when the letter isn't used in any other situation like why don't you just use the letter C. Voiceless consonants are all written with voiceless letters and followed by an apostrophe for ejectives, an H for regular aspiration and an H Karen for velar aspiration. Voiced letters of course are used for transcribing voiced consonants and the letter Y is used for the palatal semivowel. The Lakota Language Consortium has keyboards for several different devices available for installation, link in the description, but you can also effectively use a Northern Sami keyboard for typing Lakota letters, which is the approach I took for writing this video script. Numbers. Lakota uses is a decimal system for counting and has words for the tens, hundreds, thousands, and millions value. Numbers 11 through 19 are expressed with the prefix age, and there is also a unique word for the number 1, wanji, which is only used for counting. Ordinal numbers are expressed through the prefix ichi, except for first, which is its own word troka. There is also the diminutive and clitic la, which when attached to numbers is used to express only, and the suffix gia, which expresses a number of directional places or to count by a certain number. So for example, the word yamanila means only three, and Yamanikiya means in three different directions, in three different places, or to count by threes. Kinship. Lakota kinship largely follows an Iroquois kinship system when mapped out on a family tree, and terms for family members are also inflected with possessive forms, i.e. my sister, your sister, his or her sister, etc., with the first person form often being used as the term of address. Terms for siblings distinguish between whether the sibling in question is male or female, whether they are older or younger than the speaker, as well as, interestingly, whether the speaker is male or female. Parallel cousins are also regarded as siblings, whereas cross cousins have their own distinct terms which also distinguish between the gender of both the speaker and the cousin in question, but not their relative ages for some reason. The terms for mother and father are also used for the parents' same-sex siblings, with the aunt and uncle status given to the siblings of the opposite sex to the parents, and the possessive forms of mother and father follow slightly irregular patterns. The reciprocal terms for children do distinguish between male and female, but as the terms only differ from each 
each other by a single vowel, I'm not sure if they'd be considered variants of the same word, although there is also an alternate word for daughter not used as a term of address. The terms for grandparents historically were split between paternal and maternal grandparents, but that distinction has gone out of fashion nowadays with terms currently only distinguishing between gender. Interestingly, the reciprocal terms for grandchildren do not distinguish between gender. Grammar. Lakota is an agglutinative and largely postpositional language. Postpositional being the word I meant to say in the last MLR video, but only remembered halfway through editing. And the word order of Lakota is pretty much strictly SOV. Nominal modifiers always come after the noun they modify, following the order of noun, adjective, number, article, demonstrative, ad position, the exact opposite order to English. Verbs are only conjugated according to person and number, but that makes verb conjugation sound a lot simpler than it actually is. I'll try and go through it step by step. Starting with intransitive verbs, depending on the class of the verb in question, there are three different variants for the first person singular and for both the second person singular and plural, so that's already a bit complicated. The first person dual and plural, however, has the same form regardless of verb class, and the plural conjugation for all persons is marked with the plural suffix be. Third person is expressed with a null morpheme, which in layman's terms means you literally don't add anything at all. Now, while most people call them prefixes, more often than not, personal affixes are actually infixed into the verb. This is one of the reasons I find Lakota verbs a little tricky, since the middle of the word is the bit that changes, and sometimes it's difficult to determine which part of the verb is the pronominal affix, if it's even there at all. Transitive verb conjugation, however, is a little easier to pick up on in my opinion, but still a little complicated, as it follows a more or less OSV structure in complete defiance to the standard SOV word order for basic sentences. For third person objects, the conjugation is largely the same as intransitive verbs being expressed through a null morpheme again, except for animate plural objects where the subject is preceded by the affix which ha. Which ha, I'm pretty sure, is taken from the word for man or human, which must mean, at least according to Lakota verb conjugation, animals are people too, you know? First person objects are a little more logical and maintain the same form regardless of verb class, but even though I've drawn them here, I'm not exactly sure if a distinction is made between dual and plural objects in this case. Either way, plural objects are also marked with the plural suffix. Second person objects follow a pattern similar to first person, but with a few irregularities. First of all, while the common second person object affix is ni, a unique affix chi is used with a first person singular subject and also does not change according to the verb class. And second of all, for some reason, the second person object goes after the first person plural subject, making the conjugation follow an SOV pattern again. But for something even more confusing, remember how the third person is always expressed through a null morpheme and the first person plural uses the same form for subject and object? How the hell do you determine which is the subject and which is the object in conjugations with those specific persons? Is it all based on context? Is there any way to specify what you mean? I have no idea. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention that any time the subject and the object are the same person, a reflexive form of the verb is used instead, usually created with the affix ich e. But I'm fairly certain that's enough information you need for conjugating verbs anyway, so let's finally talk about nouns. Nouns in a Lakota sentence are entirely optional, in very much the same way Japanese works. If it's obvious from context what you're talking about, or if it was mentioned in a previous sentence, you don't exactly have to mention it again. Nouns do not decline for grammatical case, which is why word order is slightly stricter for Lakota sentences. Although, nouns do conjugate according to person and number in very much the same way verbs do. In fact, it might be more grammatically accurate to call nouns in Lakota copulative verbs. For example, the common word for bear, as in the animal, is matro, but it could also be translated as he, she, or it is a bear. Thus, logically in order to say to someone you are a bear all you have to do is conjugate the noun to mayatro. Also fun fact calling someone a bear in Lakota is an archaic way of calling someone fiercely angry which yeah, that, that does make sense. But then you might be wondering, how does the language determine which words are verbs and which are nouns in a sentence? Well, Lakota usually marks words with an article to specify that this is an object or a thing you're talking about and not a bunch of random events occurring together. There are four main articles in Lakota. The words gi and wang are usually translated as your standard definite and indefinite articles respectfully. But there is also the word k'un, which is a definite article relating back to a topic previously discussed, and the 
the word wanxi, which is a hypothetical or irrealis indefinite article. The latter is also the common form of the number one. Pronouns in Lakota rarely ever appear independently, but whenever they do, they are usually used for emphasis, since most of the time they appear on verb conjugation. In fact, independent pronouns are technically conjugations of the verb to be the one, so apparently Lakota also believes we're in the matrix, I guess. There are possessive pronouns as well, which can also appear independently, usually as conjugations of the verb to belong to someone, but they may also appear as pronominal prefixes attached to nouns. A distinction is also made between alienable and inalienable possession, the latter of which being used for things like body parts and kinship terms, as previously shown. One other important thing about Lakota grammar is the uplouts. Several words ending in a ah or ah may change their final vowel to a er or e in certain environments. The ing uplout is only triggered before these three common enclitics and these two conjunctions, but words undergo a er uplout if they are the last word in a sentence, if they're followed by a definite article, or before various other conjunctions and enclitics, including the negative enclitic schni. You may also have noticed that Lakota is full of enclitics, these tiny little particles and suffixes that add extra detailed meaning to the sentence. As mentioned before, enclitics can express number, definiteness or negation, but they can also express certain aspects or moods, function as interrogatives, mark evidentiality, express repetition, function as interrogatives. There are also a handful of enclitics which differ in form based on the gender of the speaker. The most most common one I've seen being the assertive clitics yalo and the ye, being traditionally used by men and women respectfully. My point is there are a lot of enclitics, and the only way to understand what each of them does is to pay attention to how each one changes the sentence. Alternatively, you could just look them up online in the new Lakota dictionary, which is the main source I use for learning Lakota. It does restrict your searches to only five words per day unless you've registered a username with a Lakota language forum, but registration is completely free, and gaining a less limited access to the dictionary did wonders for my knowledge about the language. As I mentioned before, the Lakota Language Consortium has various versions of the Lakota keyboard, but they also have several other sources for learning and studying the language. Not only for studying in a course with native speakers, which is always the better option, but they also provide many resources for people to study the language by themselves. Like, say, for example, if you're living in an entirely different continent and don't exactly have the means to learn Lakota in an immersion program, not that I'd know anything about that. There is also an updated version of the new Lakota dictionary available for downloading directly onto your computer, but I don't know much about it since I haven't downloaded it. I'm sorry, but I need the computer space for learning other languages as well. And once again, of course, there are loads of Lakota speakers on social media who are dedicated to keeping the language alive, to the point where some of them decide never to post anything in English, which is always a fantastic sign. And speaking of social media, don't forget to use your special attack by turning that like button blue, sharing this video with your friends online, and subscribing for more minority language reports. I've already planned to make a Northern Sami MLR for next week, but I'm not sure what I'll be doing after that. So if you have any suggestions for a language you want me to cover in a future video, be sure to leave them in the comments down below, as well as follow me on social media, and I'll see what I can do. Thank you all for listening, and we'll speak again next time. and the syllable onsets may contain consonant clusters. However, syllable onsets may contain consonant clusters. It sounds like an allergy warning. <laughs> Always consult a doctor before consuming consonant clusters. If allergic symptoms persist, please contact a speech pathologist. <laughs>